Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Illinois Arts Council Agency, and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Quincy at the Public Library, where, interestingly enough, we have icons of um, a period of Quincy's history that many of you may not be aware of. Uh, Quincy was the headquarters of uh, a company that made um, nativity scenes, toy soldiers, plastic figurines that were known all around the country. And uh, I, in fact, I have a copy of a book here by Ken Glennon, who's our guest, and it's called The Dime Store Dynasty of J.H. Miller. And J.H. Miller is the, the mastermind um, of behind this company that we're going to talk about, the J.H. Miller Company. The building's still there, um, and, and hundreds of people from the Quincy area were, were, uh, were employed there uh, over a period of almost 20 years. And uh, Ken, it's, it's, uh, you got so interested in Tyke Miller. His nickname was Tyke. Yes. Uh, you got so interested in him that you just had to write a book. And this is so detailed. And I, I must say, there's a lot of minutiae in here <laughs> that only a real fanatic would really, really want to want to delve into. It's really very interesting. Thank you, Mark. How did you get so hooked on this? Well, it started when I was a boy. Um, you could buy toy soldiers at that time for mm -hmm. 19 cents a piece. They were very detailed compared to the lead soldiers that historically were all that boys had to play with up mm -hmm. until that time. Mm -hmm. His figurines stood like five inches tall. Scale models of soldiers. Anyway, I collected those. Yeah, and, and we're gonna see your collection too because you brought, well, we're gonna see a lot of things, but we will definitely take a look at those toy soldiers. You Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. But what got him started was the nativity scenes, right? That's how he got started, yes. Well, you've, you've laid out a number of these and these kind of go by period, don't they? They do. Show us the Evanston series. It started in Evanston, Illinois, in his basement is what it was. Uh, Tyke was a nonconformist. Uh, There's a background of how he met his wife. They were in school and all of that. And uh, it ended up where he went to work at the, uh, at, at the World's Fair. And he was there a short period of time, realized he had to do his own thing. Mm -hmm. The family uh, realized that he could start this business. His brother attended, Max attended the uh, Chicago Art Institute, mm -hmm. and uh, they knew that if you had a nativity set and one piece broke, you can, you can go to the dime store and buy a replacement. You had to buy a whole set. A whole set, sure. So yeah. that, that, was the, that was the inspiration. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't stay in Evanston forever, of course. He, now this is Evanston Series 2, yes. and this is, this is different, of course. They're, they're smaller. They yes. look more detailed, too. Are they, are, do they have that's, more detail? That's very true, yeah. Mark. What happens initially when, when people get into something, they make it too big, they make it too complicated, mm -hmm. and they economize as they go on. I found that out about these sculptures, having studied the lineage of them. Mm -hmm. um, so he came out with a, a couple of different series in Evanston, and then the, uh, the, the production got to the point where he needed to get a factory. So he got a mm -hmm. small factory in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And once again, that Chicago factory just grew and grew, and then they needed a purpose-built or a purpose facility factory, and the search was on. Uh-huh. The search was on, and he picked Quincy, didn't he? He did. <laughs> Why? His father was the regional manager for Kresge's mm -hmm. dime store, and Kresge is the parent of Kmart, and they were huge. And so he was a Chicago regional manager. He had a lot of connections. Mm -hmm. They realized that the Chicago market industrially was more expensive. Um, sure. a, a lot of things uh, led them to think a rural situation mm -hmm. would be better. And he had a contact. Roy Miller, his father, had a contact in Quincy. So Tyke Miller and his wife Shirley jumped on an Indian motorcycle on a beautiful <laughs> autumn day and came down to look at Quincy. They also looked at uh, St. Louis mm -hmm. and they decided on Quincy. Well, they, they we're lucky they did and they must have really liked it. Well, it's, it, it is rural. It's on the river. So transportation yes. was, was a good, was a benefit for them, wasn't it? It was indeed. And these are some of the, some of the products that were made here 
And you say early Hampshire. This is the Hampshire Street plant in Quincy. That's still there, isn't it? It is. Where these were made. It was a four-story building. It's now a two-story building mm -hmm. due to the history of fires in Quincy. But oh, yes, sure. the building is yeah. still there. And now these, these figurines are different from the Chicago series in what way? Um, in a significant way. Um, at this factory, he designed a conveyor belt. Uh, so the, the, the figurine would come out of its rubber mold and it would have a paper tab that extended about this mm -hmm. high. That tab was put on a clip and hundreds of these were put on this conveyor okay. hanging by hanging their clips down. Mm -hmm. and, and they would travel along and go into a basic paint color and be dipped. Mm -hmm. And by the time they got to the end of that conveyor line, they would be taken off, this would be snipped mm -hmm. and they would have the base color for the figurine. Okay. That way it would then go on the conveyor line and all that the girls had to do to finish it was apply these other colors. But they did hand paint them. They, they did hand paint after the, the base was on but they hand painted them after that. These were done with the airbrush. Oh okay. But the facial details were done by finish. They called them finish girls. Oh, okay. They would do the eyes by hand mm -hmm. with the brush, the lips, beards, etc. Well, it's remarkable when you look at look at the detail on, on this king. That's right really something. And these are collector's items, aren't they? These are still very desirable. Everything is, yes. Yeah, and yeah. a lot of these are in homes across America yet mm -hmm. today, handed down from generation to generation. Uh, I'm not surprised. And I imagine they get very carefully wrapped and stored every Christmas. <laughs> yeah, and it's probably. a big night when you get out the Christmas sure. tree and, set, and get these out again. Absolutely. Okay, next we're going to talk about the industry itself, the industry here in Quincy, because there were two plants. Yes. Hundreds of people were employed. Yes, he had 400 people at the at the peak. Wow. Uh, he started out at the Hampshire Street, 225 Hampshire Street facility, mm -hmm. and knew he had to get bigger. So he bought um, uh, area on the York Street plant, and in doing so, he came up with a whole new painting uh, system, wherein the, the clips were done with, and you can tell that transition by the absence of the clip mark mm -hmm. on the figurines from that era. Because what they did then, they were put on a conveyor and they all traveled through a spray boost. So the base color was applied in that manner. Mm -hmm. Then they continued down the line with the finished detail as they did previously. Well, Ken, one thing about, about Tyke Miller, he was never short of ideas, was he? Oh, that's true. In, in fact, he probably had too many because he would kind of flip from one thing to another, wouldn't Mark, he? Mark, I don't know how this guy slept. <laughs> well, this is, this is interesting because we call this a diorama, and he, he was, was producing this at the Quincy plant, and I imagine that there were people that never saw anything like this for a Christmas decoration. That's true. They, you, you know, now we're, this is the 1940s. Mm -hmm. So something like this would be very, very impressive in that era. I mean, you know, there's no TV uh, of any prominence. Uh, so yeah, that, was, that mm -hmm. was probably, and what he did here, he wanted to diversify from the straight nativity <clears throat> into a, other product lines. Sure. Sure, a, a secular line. What the heck? You know, yeah. get more customers. Yeah. Um, another interesting thing, he he had always had ideas. He wanted to be able to produce Easter eggs that would come apart and that you could put items in, maybe little chicks or maybe coins or maybe jelly beans or whatever. And we still see these around today. You see them hanging from people's trees out in their yard, and That's and true. when people go Easter egg hunting, they they use these for the kids. But he thought of it way back in the 40s, didn't he? He did, indeed. <laughs> and he had these made in Peoria. By the Peoria Plastic Company. He contracted with them to make them. Yeah. And they were so popular that Peoria Plastic contacted him and said, Tyke, we're going to have to invest in more machines. Is that okay? He said, go with it. And they saturated the market. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, well, they're still being made. I don't know if they're still well, being made in the area, but they're still now. being made. Oh, like everything, right? Yeah. Yeah, like everything. Okay, we were talking about the toy soldiers. And you have a particular personal interest in this because you started as a kid collecting yes. toy soldiers. And they were Miller toy soldiers. Can you, yes. can you pick out the first one that you, that you remember getting? I believe it was this guy. A flag bearer. Mm -hmm. He's planting a flag, and everyone is of the assumption that it is Iwo Jima. 
Uh huh. Okay. Okay. That was the first piece. They were 19 cents a piece then, Mark. 19 cents. My and goodness. I well, they're collector's items. They're worth. They're oh, worth today. a lot, aren't oh, they? Oh yes, yeah. indeed. And you've got the whole the whole militia here. That's um, it. Pick up the general for us, will you? Because he's a he's an exact replica, isn't he? Yes, he what is. What are we looking at here? General Douglas MacArthur with his signature yeah, sunglasses, yeah. his corn cob pipe, um, and his his signature stature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are these made out of? These are made of plaster of Paris. Okay, so so that's actually kind of old world, isn't it? Because aren't we talking now? Plastic is is really what what figurines are made of now, right? That's true. And when did that come along? Well, just about this time in history, 1950 and 1951, is when he made these products. Mm -hmm. well, you know, these are, these are really heavy. And I imagine that's, of course, they were lead before this, but, so they were heavier than this. But these are lighter than what kids were used to, but they're still quite a bit to, to haul around. Yes, yes, they are. Were they sturdy? Uh, well, it depends on how much war you put them through. <laughs> you get kids. a BB gun, you're going to yeah. annihilate them. Oh, my goodness. Know? And but if you're, if you're careful with them, they're still here today. Uh-oh, I, I think I'm, I'm, I better not pick that up. I'm going to mess something up. Because that nurse is part of the, part of the deal, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And That's really intricate right there. There's a secret to these and that we found out, collectors found out through the years, that faces on the figurines were actually characters from the movies. This particular one has Frank, Frank Sinatra's face. No kidding. Um, this one is very distinctive in that this, this is kind of the guy who started it all, mm -hmm. Robert Mitchum. It looks like Mitchum. It is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A collector sent this to Robert Mitchum's son mm -hmm. and asked him to, signa to put a signature mm -hmm. on it. And, and he did. He sent it back to him, yeah. signed by Robert Mitchum. Now, now these are made, all made in Quincy. Yes. And, um, and, and like you say, during this period, right before plastics takes over, this is really the heyday for Miller, isn't it? That was the zenith, yeah. Mm -hmm. From after, at, during and after the war mm -hmm. and, and through the 50s. Yeah, through mm -hmm. the 50s they thrived. Mm -hmm. Yes, they mm -hmm. did. Um, let's go next to the plastic area because I think that's, for, for the industry anyway, I'm going to follow you. As the industry goes anyway, that, that's sort of where this was going, right? It was. And his first venture in plastic was the nativity pieces. Okay. okay. He started mm -hmm. with that. And he made the, the, same, the same nativity pieces only in plastic. And then he graduated to the new generation, oh, these are which were the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And his brother Max had an association with the Natural History Museum in Chicago and the artwork of uh, an artist, I believe his name was Knight. And they scaled these uh, figurines off of that. Wow. And Ruth Dudley was the sculptor credited yes. with And this is, doing she, the she was a Quincy, and I assume, right? Yes, She lived yes. in Quincy. Yes. And there she is doing the sculpt. So she's, she's actually sculpting a mold, I guess. Is that what she's doing? That's there? right. Yeah. She's doing a mold of mm -hmm. the brontosaurus right here. That's exquisite. These are really good. And, and they're very collectible yeah. today. Boys particularly loved, well they still do, love yeah. dinosaurs. They do. I, I did. I don't know why, but I, I did. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so this was another, this is like the fifth, well, late 40s and 50s. Is that what we're talking about here? With the, now, now, now we're in the 50s. Okay, in the 50s. Okay, take us next to the next uh, uh, the, the next generation, next of course we're all in plastic now, mm -hmm. was what they called the Jungle Series. And uh, at the time, uh, Marlon Perkins had a TV show, uh, I think it was called Wild America or something mm -hmm, like that, for mm -hmm. uh, Mutual of Omaha. Right. It was on TV all the time. Wild and Kingdom. Wild Kingdom, Wild Kingdom. that's yep, it. I remember it. And that was an inspiration for Tyke. And he came out with this series, even, even to the, you know, the scale of his little jungle hut. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and for collectors today, they're, they're just so, so desirable. And he started with, uh, he made them in, in three sizes, small, medium, and large. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, and then we got all involved in uh, outer space creatures, huh? and aliens, and God knows whatever you could dream up, huh? Exactly, Earth invaders. Earth invaders. It was in, the, uh, once again, it's in the mid-50s, and there was a national... Uh, craze about flying saucers. They mm -hmm. were in the newspapers and sightings every day. 
Uh, along the way, the record came out, um, the Flying Purple People Eater. <laughs> yeah, there's, and, and there's a little vinyl right there. Right, that's the record. <laughs> the, the Purple People Eater, and that was the very first, that was the genesis, Mark, for uh, this entire series of mm -hmm. Earth Invaders was a Purple mm -hmm. People Eater. Mm -hmm. And again, these were made here in Quincy. Yes. At, at the plant. I love this one. Yes. I love this one. Look at that. Oh, wow. I wonder if the parents liked this as much as they liked, you know, the, uh, the, the other ones. I don't know if they, it's kind of creepy. Some, um, yes, and some of these today, the, the, uh, this one is so rare that I just have this model of it. Um, they're worth like um, $1,800. Really? If you can find oh, one. Oh, my goodness. And you couldn't find one, right? No, because I couldn't. You, or you couldn't afford one, one or the yeah, other. Yeah, probably both. <laughs> okay. Okay, now what's, what's going on here? Well, I, I think first we should mention this. Uh, at the, at, this was the end of the Quincy uh, program. Okay. And Tyke took that uh, technology for those machines and made it into a commercial machine in that mm -hmm. um, anyone could make a model. He moved to California. Mm -hmm. He and his partner... Millard Helms. Let's show Millard here. Made the, uh, the new machine, put it together, mm -hmm. and went to Disney World and said, uh, Walt, we have an idea. Wow. And they bought it. Disney bought it. Wow. Disney bought it. And oh, these, are, these are figurines mm -hmm. that were made on that machine. Mm -hmm. and, and that machine was called, was that the coin? coin Coinomatic. Coinmatic, okay. And so you would put... You'd put your coin in and you'd choose which, which you wanted and it would just make it on demand. Well, it would make whatever mold was there at the moment. They would, they would have to change the mold and I they see. periodically did it. So One get, at a time. Huh? Right. Okay. You get Jiminy Cricket today and you get mm -hmm. Donald Duck the next day, oh, whatever wow. they had. So he's not, his plant is not operating anymore. It's done in Quincy. His in plants Quincy. are closed. Yeah, it's gone. He's off and he's, he's, he's probably making more money doing designing and, and selling patents than anything else. Yes, and it's a lot less complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was followed by spin-offs. After, after this enterprise, uh, his molding process was sold to ARA, uh, a company that had all the molding machines across America. Mm -hmm. He was at a show, Tyke was at a show, uh, a trade show with his machine and ARA had to have it. Mm -hmm. So he came into his next millions of dollars with wow. that and these are ARA products. Mm -hmm. And these are, are these are plastic again? or these? No, are these are plaster and, and once again he inspired these these are made by individuals today with his machine. So mm -hmm. he inspired this new generation of creation. This is in the same genre as the original Miller Soldiers, but they are figurines that Tyke didn't make. For example, General Patton uh, and General Montgomery. Mm -hmm. These were not made by Tyke, and the thought was, by yours truly, mm -hmm. that had Tyke continued, what would he have made? And that, that's the genesis for this series they're called 21st century J.H. Miller. Mm -hmm. Ken, not only did Tyke choose Quincy for their base of operations for their factory, they also wanted to live in the area. Yes. And they looked around, and I'm assuming that they looked far and wide because they found their dream home and their dream piece of property yes. over on the Missouri side of the river. They did. Yeah. They lived in Quincy for a while, mm -hmm. and he just needed more more house, more property, yes, mm -hmm. and they found it over there. Well, and he didn't mind, his wife Shirley, right. she, she was also a hard worker. They didn't mind spending their money, did they? No, not at all. They, when, they, when they bought that, what is it, LaGrange, Missouri? It's or, in LaGrange, yes. Yeah. Tell me about that. It was more like a compound than a home. Well, it, it originally was a, a scout camp. And, uh, and before that, it, it had natural springs and it was a spa for many years. Mm -hmm. So at the time they came along, 1947, things are doing good, there's money in the bank, they want a permanent residence. Mm -hmm. This had 10 acres, it had everything that they wanted, but it was dilapidated. Oh. So they rebuilt on the site. Oh, okay, so it wasn't like they just bought an expensive place and moved in. They had work to do. 
They did. And they didn't mind working either, did they? They engaged it because mm -hmm. it was going to be their way, and that's how these folks were. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What do you know about Tyke and his family? He came from a, a his father was successful. He was yes. a big exec with Kresge, like you said, and yes. it, it helped Tyke get started. But was, was he an exceptional member of his own family? As his family, so was he sort of exceptional? Well, every one of them was. Mm -hmm. His siblings, to the person, was. Mm -hmm. But we could talk all day on that. But yes, Tyke was very, very, very driven, uh, very focused, and just dynamic. Uh, he needed someone to hold him back a little bit. He was so uh -huh. dynamic. And that's mm -hmm. what Shirley did and his business manager did. Mm -hmm. Shirley and he were sort of like love at first sight, weren't they? Oh, I think yeah. they were together all through high school. Uh, uh, and then it started in college. In, in co oh, it started in college? Yes. Okay. She actually dated his brother and they went mm -hmm. on a, a double date and the conversation was between her and Tyke and the other couples are just kind of cut out. <laughs> <laughs> they knew right off the bat. Yes. They, I think they even eloped, didn't they? Well, they did, yeah. They, they were in college together, Cornell College mm -hmm. in Iowa, and uh, they were nonconformist, and Tyke was sneaking into her facility and so forth mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. which was, anyway, um, they ended up where uh, they were asked to leave, mm -hmm. and they eloped on a, on a uh, Thanksgiving holiday so no one would know in the family. And uh, she went on to a different college, and he went on to work at the uh, World's Fair. Mm -hmm. in, 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 in Chicago? In, in New York City. Oh, in New York, in New York City? Yes. Oh, okay. This is 1939. All right. Well, he, he must have learned something there because he certainly, he certainly learned how to, how to take whatever that was and succeed with it. Yes, indeed he did. And he caught on quick. Mm -hmm. Now, um, he, also, he and Shirley had a family. They did. Um, tell us about them a little bit. Um, they, they, they were all, all driven to be performers. These are awards that the kids won in athletics. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jacques was a tennis player, uh, so was Gay, and, and Todd was a swimmer. In each of their respective fields, they were, they were up to a national level almost mm -hmm. in achievements for sports. Yeah. And they were driven by this man right here. Ty well, Miller. as a matter of fact, he was a very good wrestler in college, he wasn't was. he? And dreamed of wrestling in the Olympics. He was he was aspiring to go into the 1940 Olympics, mm -hmm. and we know what happened then. Mm -hmm. World War II came along, and oh, that okay. was the end of that. Mm -hmm. And he even followed up on the Olympics later in life and got involved with it, making a trophy for a special class of uh, competition in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at your collection here, and I know I've seen some of this collection before. Yes. Have you loaned this to a local, a local museum? Yes, it's been in two museums. Both mm -hmm. museums in Quincy have mm -hmm. displayed these items, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, they uh, they were at uh, the uh, Quincy Museum. Right. That's where I saw them. And Quincy the Adam, Museum. Adams County uh, Historical mm -hmm. Society Museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Quincy Museum had a bigger display and a bigger facility, but. Yes, they've, they've all been here. Mm -hmm. um, do you consider yourself a collector or do you consider yourself a historian on this? On this? I started out <laughs> as a collector and I guess I still am kind of a little bit, but I need to find a permanent residency for these. Mm -hmm. And a, a museum, uh, you know, this is Illinois history. It's rich Illinois yeah, history. It is. Tyke and all the people that work for him are all from Illinois. And find a permanent residency in a, in a museum in, in Illinois. Yeah. Yeah, it would it would be very nice if we could find one of these old buildings in downtown Quincy that needs a tenant. Yeah, oh yeah, and uh, and and have some space there for this because because it really is a it's a piece of it's a piece of Quincy history. Pe people that were aware of the Miller Company, but they probably didn't know that they were a preeminent producer of these kinds of that's, things for for fifteen or twenty years. That's so true, Mark. Because you know, I I say that he's been hidden in the attic of time. Mm -hmm. And it's time for them to come out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you're doing your best. I do. And uh, and actually, with your with your book uh, and with all that we're doing right now, I, t I tell you, I want to take a look at that big black cat that we just scanned by there because this stands out as a piece of art more than a piece of hobby uh, to me. Well, it is both. Mm -hmm. um, about the time television finally came to most all of the homes in America. Uh, house, home, home keepers had a lot of freedom they didn't have before because they had automatic wash machines and all sorts of revolution was going on. Mm -hmm. They had, you know, disposable cash. If you got a new TV across America, you had to have a black 
leopard on, on your television, on top of your television, or on your coffee table. I missed that somehow. It was a fad, a well. national fad. And they were made out of ceramic by other industries. And Tyke Miller said, whoa, I want in on this. Mm -hmm. So he made his Plaster of Paris versions, mm -hmm. three of them, three different sizes. And that's sizes. Plaster of Paris? That's Plaster of Paris. Wow, that is sleek. And they sold by the millions. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. And that was produced here in Quincy? Yes. Mm -hmm. It is beautiful. Um, were, were, the, were the design features of that very similar to other companies, or did, they have, did Tyke have his own very individual design? That's a good question. In that, uh, yes, it, it, it's, it's a takeoff on the others. Mm -hmm. Very similar, you know, but mm -hmm. it was his pose and all of that. Mm -hmm. Well, Ken, this has been an eye opener. I, I'm not I'm not just for me, but for our audience, I'm sure, because the J. H. Miller Company went, does, doesn't ring a lot of bells for a lot of people, but but it will from now on. Great, Mark. Yeah, yeah. That's thank wonderful. you very much. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank not only Ken Glennon, but also the uh, Quincy Public Library for making space for for us here today, and uh, remind you that uh, you can certainly learn more about the J. H. Miller Company through through Ken's book. With another Illinois story in Quincy, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Illinois Arts Council Agency, and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you.